So good afternoon and thank you for coming to this session on the Internet of Things. So what is this Internet of Things? Um, basically, uh, in the most basic form, it is about objects or things getting connected. Um, so they communicate together and they communicate with the user, hopefully providing some value. Um, looking around, we might see, for instance, in the living room that we have AV equipment that nowadays is connected. You got smart TV that can you can watch YouTube on it, get weather information. Uh, some have Skype. You get um, your AV receiver that will pop up a notification saying it needs an update. Going a bit broader, you see that in the living room, in the smart home, sorry, um, you have the lights, the blinds, the um, uh, security equipment, or the heating, ventilation. Everything gets connected. And in everyday life, um, we also nowadays are always connected. We have communication devices with us, smartphones, most of us have smartphones and tablets. Uh, we have uh, fitness equipment like the Fitbit, so we carry them around all day long and they collect uh, our activity, they collect our sleep patterns. Uh, we have uh, healthcare equipment, for instance, we can read blood pressure. And going even a step broader, we have the smart city. Well, in the end, it is very similar. We have the lights that get control from a central place. We get uh, big displays that will push messages to us. We get security camera, uh, sensors that can give uh, parking information and things like that. Uh, with the addition that instead of being just one person or one family, it's now a whole community. So there is a social aspect also adding to that. Now, Looking at specifically one device, the Fitbit, we see that uh, it has sensors, so it's collecting data. It has small display, so it can give feedback to the user. It has a companion mobile app, where you can also visualize some data. I can check uh, the steps I took today. I can control the device, like program the alarm clock for tomorrow. Uh, there's a website, where again, I can visualize data. Maybe in a more advanced form, like uh, I have historical data, a graph of the, the steps I took for the last months. Um, and I can control the device through that website too. And for that, I need a user profile, so username, password to log in. Taking a look at another device, the Nest connected thermostat, uh, same thing. It has sensors, it will read the temperature, it will read, uh, detect presence in the home. Uh, it has a rotary dial, so the user can interact with it, and it has a display to give feedback. Uh, there is a companion mobile app to display information to control the thermostat. There's a website so that you can, again, have a dashboard and control the thermostat, and you need a username and password to log in. So looking uh, at those devices, you see that they very much exist in their own silos. They are connected, but not interconnected, really. They live in the whole little world, but they share commonalities. They collect data through sensors. They somehow process the data. They have some logic, some rules. Um, they uh, allow the user to visualize the data from mobile application or from websites. And they allow the user to control the device, again, mobile or website. Plus, all the required things like uh, user profile, security, logging, etc., etc., etc. So those manufacturers need to each and every time re-implement the building blocks to provide that basic plumbing, basic infrastructure. Uh, and it's not where their added value is. They really their added value is just a small bits and pieces on top of that. Um, and so if we can replace that with a common infrastructure. It means that they don't have to reinvent the wheel each and every time. It also means that now, instead of being only vertical in the different silos, we can go horizontal and have those devices really interconnected. So if I want to, somebody would want to have a go at implementing that common middleware, what would the problems be? Uh, sorry. First of all, we see that each and every device will have a different protocol. Hopefully the one I showed, um, the Nest has now a developer program, so they will have a public API. The Philips Hue, the API is public. Same thing for the Fitbit. So hopefully 
it's, it, there's a trend now that it's becoming a bit more open, but still, every time it's different. Uh, and then there are devices where it's just closed. So proper protocols, you can't do much. You need to reverse engineer. It takes a lot of time. There are, there have been, and there are some standardization efforts. So in the home automation field, you have like KNX, uh, Z-Wave, Zigbee. But then, for instance, taking Zigbee, uh, you still have within Zigbee different profiles. So it's not completely different protocol, but still many different profiles, many. Uh, different standards to, to go after. And the market is, is quite, um, the distribution is quite expensive for those these devices. So this leads to what we call the industry vicious cycle, where the fact that there is no standardization means that when you want to integrate the devices together, the integration cost is very high, meaning that the complete solution is quite, uh, uh, quite costly and that the market for that is a niche market, a luxury market. And when you have a luxury market, uh, it, that usually stays small, and the players in the market, um, they want to keep their market share, so they are not keen to open, meaning that it reinforces the fact that there is no standardization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and we arrive to a status quo deadlock, which, of course, is something we do not want. Um, and we, we, we hope to have a solution, we think we have one. And the way it started is with, with open source. Uh, why open source? Well, the first thing is, when you want to tackle a problem, you often uh, go to what, what you know. It's, you, 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 you take your experience with you. And uh, Open Remote was founded by Mark Fleury and Joel Inforce, both from JBoss. Uh, Mark Fleury founded JBoss, and it was pretty successful. So JBoss um, is an application server in the Java enterprise world that uh, was widely adopted from the developers. So the adoption was good. And from the business point of view, it was quite successful. In the end, JBoss was sold to Red Hat. So a nice, um, a nice uh, pull up there. And so they started uh, going the same route for this field. The other thing is uh, going open source is a proven and widely adopted way to do an infrastructure. I mean, we think about um, having Linux, Apache server, uh, MySQL databases, all this infrastructure for internet websites, it's, it's open source. The barrier to entry is very low. Basically, you can download the source code for free, so you can't do much cheaper than that. Um, the cost of integration is low. Um, again, you can, instead of starting from scratch, you go download the software, and the basic parts are there. You just add whatever you need for your own needs and contribute back to the project. Uh, the knowledge acquisition, acquisition costs sorry, are quite low. And uh, another point that isn't on the slide but that uh, was raised this morning during the keynote is, of course, that we want to trust all this. And one way to trust is if it's open, you can take a look at it. You, you know what's there. Everything, there is nothing hidden from you. But really, the most important part of all this in open source is the community. Uh, it is, we think, uh, very well tailored to the problem of having those multiple protocols. Because um, implementing a protocol for a device, for instance, might not make sense to a company from a business point of view, because there are not many users. And so on the balance sheet, it just doesn't compute. But it's very likely that in a community, you will find like-minded individuals that will just go after that one protocol that they want to have. And so the community will really grow the product and allow to tackle those different protocols. It's a bit the long tail way of doing things. Uh, we are quite lucky. We are currently have about, uh, in open remote, uh, 40,000 uh, visitors per month on the website um, and about uh, 4,000 downloads a month. But most importantly, we've been growing those numbers uh, on a year-by-year -year basis by about 80% each year for the last three years. So nearly doubling the community every year is uh, really nice. And this is a quote from Matt Turk uh, for TechCrunch, which says, uh, talking about Internet of Things, whether the winning platforms are open or closed will play a huge role in the future of the space. My bet would be on openness, and our bet is also on openness, so we think that's a good way to go. So open source, next uh, 
adoption of uh, standard, but we talk about standards. We don't want another property standard that would be closed, that would be uh, expensive to get to. I mean, we have in the, in the field some specification that would cost you a few thousand euro just to get the specs. That's not the way a standard should be. We want a de facto standard, like HTTP or things like that, that just grow from the community. A standard that is open, that everybody can, can look at, everybody can uh, freely implement. That is the way it should be done, and we think that having this kind of open standard is really superior to having a property ones. And the last part of the equation is off-the-shelf hardware. If we want a solution to be widely adopted, we don't want to uh, need to, have to do uh, custom hardware, often expensive, the kind of touch panel you see there on the wall. Uh, that's, that's pretty dedicated, pretty expensive one, a wide adoption. And we are pretty lucky because these days, again, the smartphones, the tablets, we find products that are powerful and cheap. Um, things like the Raspberry Pi, and very powerful computer for that is extremely affordable. And in, even in the more home automation field, if we want to take a look, we have uh, Z-Wave devices or stuff like that that is not uh, that expensive either. And when we have that in place, we think that, no, the circle is inverted. And we have a virtuous circle. That means that having open protocols leads to low cost of integration, leads to a overall solution that is cheaper, which means that the market gets much bigger. And when the market is big, the players tend to be open. And so now the circle reinforces itself. And we have an emerging ecosystem instead of the deadlock. And so open source, open standard, and off-the-shelf hardware, or even open source hardware, which is also uh, very nice, is the basis for the open remote solution. Now, what is open remote, really? Um, that's the big picture of the whole open remote ecosystem, so all the different components. The main component is the controller. The controller is the software that will uh, talk to the dif different devices. They will, it will speak their different protocols. It will run 24-7. Uh, it will get the information from the sensor and control the devices. In technical terms, it's implemented as a uh, Java application. So it should run on a broad range of devices. Everywhere Java can run, we can run the controller. Uh, and this clearly means off-the-shelf hardware. Um, things like the Raspberry Pi, it runs on the Pi, it runs on uh, NAS devices, so things like Synology, Netgear, uh, QNAP, uh, recently at the CDI in the US, QNAP use Open Remote uh, as the basis for their Open Remote, uh, their um, home automation demo. In terms of the protocols we currently support, um, we have some of the big names in terms of home, autom home automation. So KNX, Z-Wave, Zigbee, um, Anotion, Backoff, things like that. For uh, AV equipment, infrared, uh, we support the Denon, the Marantz, the Onkyo receiver. But also we support the basic protocols, so TCP, UDP, HTTP, Telnet. Which means that anything that provides an API through that mean, we can easily integrate with. And it doesn't have to be hardware, it can be software. So um, getting weather information from a weather service on the net through an HTTP interface is something that is very easy. And the role of the controller is really to be an integration platform so that you can, uh, independently of the uh, lower protocols, have the same view on it. So in this picture, we can see that we have an IP backbone. We have maybe a KNX uh, st uh, infrastructure to control the lights in the building. And we can add some uh, wireless Z-Wave devices to that equation. But still, on the top, we integrate everything. And it, it's a unique vision on top of that. The controller can run standalone. It can be act just like a bridge between protocol, or it can be automation with rules and trigger some, some things automatically. But 
most of the time, we want a user interface. And so that's the role of what we call the console, which uh, the role is simply to take some XML description of a UI and render that for the user. And so the user can know, visualize information coming from the controller, so display the temperature readings in the room or something like that, and can control the orb to the controller and then eventually the devices. We do support the main uh, culprits there, so iOS, Android, and uh, web browser. So any modern web browser we can have an interface for. And we can do that from inside the LAN or from the outside your one. So this part is the runtime. That's what you use uh, daily. But to configure the system, we have uh, all the infrastructure, the back end in the cloud. The online designer is a cloud-based, web-based tool to do the configuration. And by configuration, we mean both the devices, so configure the fact that you have a KNX or, uh, I don't know, uh, weather information through HTML, and the UI. So the standard way to define UI with button images and sliders and web widgets and whatnot. Uh, and what's very important is that we make sure that these two activities can be done separately and, and are really split uh, the responsibilities so that somebody more technical can define the devices and somebody with more of a UX or UI expertise can define the user interface. And the last bit of the ecosystem here is Beehive, which is basically our storage uh, or database thing, which means that everything you do configure in the controller gets pushed to Beehive, and then Beehive can push that to the, the controller. So that is a very quick overview of our infrastructure. Well, that's all nice, but that's technical. What, what can we do with it? Because in the end, for an end user, what matters is solutions, not, not technical stuff, not the platform. Um, so I want to start with a uh, first example. Uh, I want to briefly show a, a video of uh, open remote used in a more of a home automation or smart home environment with a typical, again, audio, video, lights, security kind of thing. So this is kind of a one-off or a custom for each home, for each application. Uh, we also um, want to work in another similar field, but more for mass market. So what we are doing is having, in collaboration with Prodrive, which is an Eindhoven company, uh, a full solution that uh, is both software, because we are a software-only company, and uh, or project, and hardware. So they provide customizable hardware. And so that uh, utility companies can have a complete solution with the hardware, the software, the back-end services to do things like uh, smart metering or energy management. A different topic uh, that 
people might not think about when uh, when when looking at this type of platform is uh, smart city and more specifically community management. Uh, in 2011, there was the Glow Festival in Endoven. So the Glow Festival is uh, an art exhibit throughout Endoven where you have different uh, art exhibits um, that are arranged in a circuit around the city. And it's quite popular, so it means that it attracts a lot of people in the city that go wandering by and then stop to look at something. Uh, and this might um, be not really an issue, but it, it becomes something to manage. And the idea of the, the city of Eindhoven is to see how, using uh, smart technology, you could facilitate that and ease the whole uh, crowd that going around the city. So the prototype that we did in collaboration with uh, several other companies was that we took two spots on that circuit, and we did have cameras that were counting the people passing by. So we had an idea of the number of people that were gathered there. We also had a couple of uh, microphones getting us the noise level. And um, there was also a mobile application that was provided by the organizers so that the visitors can get information on uh, the, the art exhibit, but they can also vote. So they had a zero to five hearts uh, rating. And what we did was uh, collect that information. And so we have the number of uh, people, the sound level, and the uh, liking of the visitors that is collected and displayed, but also that is um, passed on to rules. And the rules would decide of uh, a lighting scene that could be applied on the spot so that you could modify the lights in the street to see if that would change the behavior of the people that, was there, that were there. Uh, and that, that's what the system does. It does, based on the values collected, propose a lighting mood to apply, and then it's up to the operator to really apply it or not. So that was a prototype uh, nearly a couple of years ago. We are now moving to a uh, full installation, again in, in, with the city of Eindhoven in Stradiumsein. So Stradiumsein is an area which can be quite uh, active at times. It's, I don't know how many, 60 or 70 bars in a street. And so during a certain period of time, you have a lot of people that sometimes do not totally behave as they should. And again, they wanted to see how technology could, could ease all that. Um, and so it's the same concept, cameras counting people, um, sound measurement in the area, around in the neighborhood, so we'll see how that would impact the neighborhood. Uh, a bit more information, also weather information. We collect all that, display that on a dashboard, also uh, display historical data. And as this is a longer term project, we are now in collaboration with the, the university, it's the Living Labs project. They are studying all this data to again see how we can define rules that would control the lighting and influence the way people behave there. Uh, the last uh, application I want to talk about today is social alert. So this is more in terms of uh, healthcare or assisted living. More and more people that get uh, a bit older or have disabilities um, still want to stay at home and still want to be able to live a happy life with their own independence. Uh, so the goal of the system de there is that using uh, basic sensor in the home like uh, door contacts or presence detection, we can define basic rules that using the sensor will detect um, behavior of those, those people. Like if um, we see somebody going out at 2 a.m. and leaving the door open, we know that something might be wrong. And so the system will detect that and send a message to a caregiver or their family to say, hey, go check on the guy. Maybe there's something, something that needs to be checked there. So I hope that this gives you an idea of the broad range of applications that could be tackled with the, this, this platform. Just very briefly, uh, I want to talk about the business model because one thing uh, sometimes I get asked or we get asked is, uh, it's, it's open source, you're giving away the software, I mean, how do you live, how do you make the money? Uh, and open remote as JBoss was is 
professional open source. So it was thought out from the start with that model in mind. It means that there is a company behind the project. It got funding so that we didn't start a project with, you know, we create a repository on SourceForge and there's nothing in there and just hope people will come. So there is something there to start with. Uh, we are also very careful in terms of licensing and in terms of code contribution to make it work. And since uh, a year approximately, we have been pushing a bit more on the commercial aspect. And we now have three business propositions. So in addition to the open source project, which is still there, totally free, we now have professional designer, which is for one of projects, uh, you have integrators or designers who want to have access to what we call the professional designer, which is like the free one which with more tools so that it can streamline their process as professionals. Uh, we also target more the, the mass market where um, manufacturers might want to bundle their devices with potential use with open remote, which means that they can get cloud hosting designer with their own brand in there, maybe some specific protocol. And the last one is uh, OEM, so device manufacturers that would want to include the open remote platform inside their device. And so there we have a um, dual licensing agreement to make sure we can cover that. So um, as a conclusion, uh, again, I hope that you've seen that you can do many things with the platform. But in the end, it is just that. It's a tool. It's a platform. So uh, hopefully, uh, you can. You can join the community and, and make something great with that platform. Uh, to do that, it's pretty easy. You can go online, openremote.org. You download the controller, install it on your own hardware. can be anything for now, your laptop or Raspberry or anything you have lying around. Go online, create a free account on the designer. You can start there, configure your device, create a UI. And then uh, go to the iOS App Store or the Google Play Store or go to the forums and download the latest version of the console. And um, to give you a bit of inspiration, I've also uh, prepared another video with some of the realization from our community members. but also companies that are quite interested in that just contribute as community members.
approach to designing a user interface is uh, somebody wanted to have a really photorealistic UI. So it took photos of the office and mapped that to uh, the live devices. So that when it touches the light on the screen, the light really goes on in the office. Or if you open the window, it opens on the UI. So that's the one thing. So thank you. I can take any question now. We also have uh, a booth just down the hall. So if you want to step by, ask any questions, see some of the some of the things I showed in the video are there. So we can have a, a live demo. The Stradun Zain project is there too, and we can talk about anything there. So thank you again for listening. <laughs> so any any question now or? So how long do you think before uh, we will all find this in our home? Is this a matter of five years? And uh, maybe some people even quicker, or is it 10? Or what do you think? Uh, in terms of finding what the, this, this kind of system? Well, I mean, you becomes mainstream in a lot of people's homes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. The thing is, the technology is there. Uh, hopefully, uh, the costs are coming down. You see things like, I mean, nests. Still a bit expensive, but it's it's getting a bit more mainstream. Um, we've been talking about home automation for really a, a long time, and I don't know exactly when it could come really be implemented. It's it's a different. I think it's a bit of a different story to know if people want to do it. There are things for which it's easier, like again uh, a thermostat. You just replace the thermostat. Uh, there are things like your electricity. You're not going to redo your whole electricity just to have automation. So um, I think for people, people who want it, it's already now affordable and you can do something. But I'm not sure on the awareness of the public also when they will really want to go there. <laughs>